Okay, it's another edition of the Penn State Blitz. So much to talk about this week. We're going to talk about Penn State and what they needed to fix and if they fixed it on the bye week. We're going to look at the Lions running back rotation, excuse me, and will it continue? We're going to we're going to revisit some maybe early predictions we made about Penn State and if they're still on track to do what we think they're going to do. And as always, we're going to get to the Penn State mailbag. Okay, Greg, Maryland week, the last three games that Penn State and Maryland have played. If you're a writer, they've been a lot of fun because you can write your story at halftime because Penn State has absolutely walloped the Terrapins. They've been, it's, the games have been like 60, 66 to 3, 38 to 3, I think 38 to 14, just non-competes. I don't know that that's going to be the case uh, when Penn State visits Maryland on Friday night, but we got a lot to get to in this edition of the Penn State Blitz. Just to talk about both teams coming off bye weeks. James Franklin talked about maybe what he needed to fix. Do you feel like the bye week was enough maybe to fix some of the issues he brought up that we've seen? Yeah, I think it almost has to be. You know, I thought Sean Clifford was pretty insightful Wednesday morning during his conference call with reporters. One of the things he said was, and we had talked about this earlier in the week, but a lot of it was fundamental flaws. It wasn't guys running wrong routes. It wasn't, um, you know, things that they can't overcome physically. It mm-hmm. was, you know, he he thought he was off balance on some of the missed deep balls. Right. He thought that he could have put the ball in better position when facing pressure um, and that was maybe some of the reason that when KJ Hamler had a step or two he didn't hit guys so um, and then when it comes to you know so that was one area mm-hmm. he talked about and then third downs are what we've heard a lot about from James Franklin especially on offense and the one thing I think that jumped out to him Bob was him being Sean Clifford was and James Franklin's reiterate this hundred times that they're not necessarily taking that first and second down approach to third down. And some of that's because they're way behind the sticks. Some mm-hmm. of that's because guys aren't executing on plays that are right. there. But overall, I mean, I think if you didn't, if a bye week's not enough time to break down three games, that probably spells doom for the future. So I, I think they better hope that that was enough time. And, uh, you know, Maryland needed it too, because that offensive line looks a little yeah. topsy turvy. Yeah, for me, the, the, the fixes that Penn State absolutely has to make, uh, one of them involves the defense and third down. Um, we, they, we talk a lot about them being seven for 30. Uh, trying to convert third downs. It's very uh, 23%. And it's just not good enough. But Penn State's defense, and James kind of addressed it uh, on Tuesday during his teleconference, they've worked very hard to get the other team, especially in the Pittsburgh game, into third and long. And then they give up big plays when there's absolutely no reason to, right. whether it's a screen, whether it's a holding penalty, a pass interference call. Too many times Penn State's been in position to get off the field by just playing sound third day, third down defense. They haven't done it. I think that's a big issue they needed to fix. He said they, they worked on it a lot in the bye week. And just to get back to Sean Clifford, um, he has missed some throws in the first three games. He's still figuring things out. I think he's going to get a lot better uh, for me. Uh, two things that I've noticed with with Sean and, and he has to fix them is when they're in scoring position and it's third down and they're going to throw the ball, he's got to learn to throw the ball away instead of taking a sack that will put them even out of Jordan Stout's <laughs> right. uh, range for a field goal. The other thing is I've noticed it. I noticed a lot in the Pittsburgh game. It's got to be addressed at the mesh point. He is not keeping the ball enough. In other words, he's, he's always giving it to the running back and Pittsburgh never played him for the keeper. It was wide open on four or five occasions. He needs to start to run the ball a little bit. And I think that'll open up some running room inside for the running backs. I would look for those two things maybe to happen against Maryland. And now let's move on to the running back rotation. I just talked about the running game. Boy, James Franklin is getting a little salty, Greg, when it comes to being asked about the running backs. To be fair, he's been asked probably about 100 times in the last two weeks. Not 100, but he's probably been asked a half dozen times. And for him, he's like, what do you guys want me to say? We like all four running backs. They're all going to play. The question is, now that we're in the Big Ten season, should they all play? Yeah, I mean, I think that's what's going to be heavily debated leading into the Maryland game, and that's something that will be watched pretty closely. I mean... Unless he's blowing smoke because he doesn't want to tip off Maryland, which right. is certainly possible, um, it, they're going to give they're going to at least give all four guys at one series, and then maybe maybe they'll be the one thing I would watch for this week is not a reduction in 
the, the fact that each guy will get a series, but maybe a reduction in what they do in the second half yeah. if the game is still close, like the Pittsburgh game. Sure. You know, will Noah Kane be utilized to help eat up some clock? Um, because there is something to be said, I think, about him coming in in the third quarter, especially if you've had a chance to wear out a defense a little bit and just letting him physically grind uh, on, you know, maybe a tired front seven from the opposing team. So I think there's probably some merit to that, but you can't forget to use him then in the fourth quarter when you're trying yeah. to run your four minute offense. So maybe they get a little bit more specialized it later in the game this week, but yeah, they, you know, even though on to the eye, it might seem like some of those guys who separated themselves. They don't feel like that's the case. Mm-hmm. I think pass blocking might be an area that, that could be an impetus for that. You mm-hmm. know, I don't know if they feel great with any of those four guys right now in terms of consistently getting in the way of opposing rushers, even if just a chip or right. a little bit. And Bob, I think that could be something that they're looking for in the separation department. Yeah, and I think absolutely one guy to watch in this Maryland game, it has to be Ricky Slade. He has not gotten off to the start. I think he wanted, Mm -hmm. certainly the fan base had high expectations uh, for him this year. He did some really good things backing up Miles Sanders, showed good burst, showed the ability to run between the tackles. Uh, I think he ran for six touchdowns. He ran for two touchdowns against Maryland last year. And we just thought he might hit the ground running and then the rest of the guys would fall in line between him. That just hasn't been the case. I don't know if he's pressing. I don't know if the offensive line and he are are just out of sync, but he is a big play threat who's really not getting loose in space. Um, And if James Franklin really believes all of the running backs are talented, I think the longer this goes where he doesn't do anything, I think the greater the chance that you will eventually see Maybe journey, maybe it'll be Journey Brown, kind of kind of grab the bull by the horns. But Ricky Slade, I think this is a really big game for him. Yeah, no question. Well, before we try and convert on third down, don't forget to like, <laughs> oh, rate, or subscribe Lord. the uh, Penn Live Penn State Blitz podcast wherever you get your audio, whether it's Google, Stitcher, Stitcher, Apple, or somewhere else. Right. If you're watching on YouTube, subscribe to the channel YouTube.com/slash All Penn State. I think we hit all the bases, Bob. Just when I think you can't get any more clever, you just pulled. That was great. That Every was really now good. again, I hit it one out. See of the now. Box. If you're, if you're going to rate the podcast, I think you got to rate Greg for that nice transition because that was, to me, that was an A+. There will be a chance for negatives later on. All right, yeah, there will be. Speaking <laughs> of that, some Penn State uh, predictions we maybe want to revisit, mm-hmm. uh, kind of what we thought they might be at the start of the year and also not in relation to the Big Ten because some things have happened uh, in, in the month of September. Yeah. A little bit surprising. Penn State sits 3-0. and um, I know that I had them 9-3. and I remember who I had them beating and who had, I had them losing to. I think you were nine nine and three as well, or are you eight and four? I was eight and four some places, nine and three others. So you, I had all my bases covered. See, now um, that's called flip flopping, and then I would maybe dock him a couple of style <laughs> exactly. points for flip flopping. That's a Dave Jones move, man. We yes. don't do that. No. Well, um, did you? Speaking of him, I saw there was a, a better the sports action app reported that there was a better who raced to put five k on Michigan to win the Big Ten title on Tuesday. I didn't know how you got to Vegas that fast after Dave <laughs> pronounced Michigan dead. Um, but kudos to you for that. Um, no, I, I think the, the interesting thing, I thought it was a good time yeah. to revisit some yeah. of this stuff heading into Big Ten play. Yeah. I thought they might lose to Michigan at home. It's mm-hmm. now impossible to see that, really. Right. Um, I mean, that Michigan team, just something's not right. And I don't, that, they had a bye week already. They didn't fix it. Yeah. I don't know how they fixed that. The Army game was real telling for, for them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, Michigan State, I thought that might be a win out there in, in East Lansing. That may be a tougher game than we thought. Mm-hmm. I think that Michigan State team is a little bit interesting. Um, and then overall, you know, I was not very high on Minnesota. You were, and they look to be off to a pretty darn good start. So I'm saving um, that. I'm holding that one back just in yeah. case I'm right. I don't want to gloat because it could blow up in my face. Right. Uh, I had them beating Michigan. I had them beating Michigan State. I think that... Michigan State obviously is a very, very good defense. I think that is a game where if Penn State can get a lead, I think it's going to go to that, down to the fourth quarter again. Right. And I think I think maybe they can make a play with some of the athletes they have uh, at the skilled positions. I will say this. I wasn't sure that Justin Fields would kind of take to the quarterback position so smoothly. I know they haven't played a lot of great teams yet, uh-huh. but he looks like he's starting to get comfortable. And Greg, he's starting to look like the coveted recruit Mm -hmm. that he was in the class where he was at one point at Penn State verbal, went to Georgia, things didn't work out. Now he's at Ohio State. It looks like he's only going to get better. And man, they really have a lot of athletes. It's going to be, they're going to be a fascinating team to watch. It looks like Ryan Day is pushing all the right buttons. And yes. I bring that up only because the Penn State at Ohio State game is going to mean a lot for both programs. Yeah, there's no question about it. The other one I'm a little bit, 
I don't. I think I'm less certain about it than I was before. But that's that game in Iowa. Yeah. Um, because they've looked a little bit better than maybe we thought they would. Penn State is obviously you know looked how it's looked through three games. I think there's been a lot of good, some yeah. bad that can be cleaned up, should be cleaned up. Uh, from a pro, you know, from a coaching staff that's been around some time with a fair amount of veteran players. So, you know, that game is obviously looms large. Oh, and the other one was, you know, if you thought Purdue was going to be a challenge at Beaver Stadium, I think, think again. Um, not Did you impressed. pick them to lose to Purdue? No, okay. but I know that that was one game that when you were looking, so, you know, some folks when they were looking ahead to the season, they thought, well, that could turn into a shootout. I don't yeah. know if I see that. Yeah, and then to be honest, we're only we're only a couple of games. Yeah, into, we'll do this again in, in a couple into weeks. the yeah. season. We're, we're I'm real. We're real. We're real big in this uh, world of second guessing each other. So right. why don't we continue to do that? But right now, I would say Penn State's about where they thought they're. I know a lot of people are like, oh man, Pitt almost had them, but you know, I mean, it's. I think you got to give Penn State a little bit of credit for that goal line stand. They right. missed some plays earlier in the game. And Pitt played well, as, as James Franklin's talked about. Other teams are now viewing Penn State as a real formidable, formidable team nationally, and they're getting everyone's best right. shot. I think there's something to that, and I think that also kind of is going to be in play when they play Maryland uh, on Friday night. I think it's a really fascinating game, and I think if Penn State's not careful and they start slow, it could get real interesting in the final 15 minutes, but... We'll get to that a little bit later. Let's let's get to the. I think it's time for the Penn State mailbag. It's time for the Penn State mailbag. And yes. uh, I hope you have some questions for me. What um what do you make of this whole idea from James Franklin, where he's kind of challenging his defensive line, kind of not happy with his defense, wants mm-hmm. some more sacks? Where are you at with his message to that group? Well, for one, I think that. Um, there's a difference between playing hard and, and giving great effort and finishing. And I think I think the effort's there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think he's that upset with his interior. I think it's his defensive ends. Now, James kind of asked for this. He spent the whole offseason just right. talking about this defensive end group as, as maybe one of the most special units he's ever coached. Mm-hmm. So expectations are high. They open against Idaho. I think they got seven sacks in that game. And so when the sacks don't come against a Buffalo team that largely wants to run the ball – pretty well but I think when you look at how people view him and maybe how the NFL views him he really hasn't really asserted himself since the Idaho game right I think he's definitely another guy I got another guy to watch excuse me uh in the Maryland game and I do think that James is, is kind of sending a subtle message I think they're in position to make plays and they just haven't finished much like they haven't finished on third down and I think that's the message that he's trying to send to the team not only through the media but I'm sure when he meets with them and you know and before practice let's tease the the second half of the Penn State uh, Blitz podcast or the second video that you can find on PennLive.com mm-hmm. slash all Penn State. What's the one concern you have or maybe the one area of weakness for this Penn State team facing Maryland? Well, I mean, what you don't want to do uh, against a team that is an underdog and is, is really geared up to play, you don't want to start slow. Mm-hmm. And if you just look at Penn State's offense, the last two games, I think they had seven points in the first half against Buffalo, and they needed a, a program record kick by Jordan Stout, 57 yards, to get to 10-10 against Pitt. And these were both home games. Right. It's different on the road, and I know Maryland is not maybe that intimidating of a place, but if they start slow there, um, they're going to really have their work cut out for them against a Terps team that I would say is probably the. I think they're more athletic than Pittsburgh. Uh, yeah. They they inherited uh, Mike Loxley inherited some good players, and then they got two or three really really talented transfers. Right. So, I mean, you know, Penn State Penn State. It looked like McFarlane really wasn't into the game last year when they played at the end of last year. I think mm-hmm. he carried I had six times for 12 yards. It was a little cold. I think it was the end of the Durkin era and the end of uh, yeah. you know, get to the finish line. I don't think they're going to get that McFarlane on right. Friday night. That's a that's a guy they got to watch. He think I think he opens up a lot for that offense. I just think the Penn State offense cannot afford to start slow or it's really going to get tight at the end. Yeah, I agree 100 percent with that. The one other thing I'm thinking about is that Kenny Pickett was really effective in part because he got the ball out of his hands quick. Josh Jackson, the Maryland quarterback, is pretty darn good at that, too. And if you let that lead to a mountain of points, it can be a problem, especially if you start slow. Yeah. And Penn State, the one thing Penn State does have going for them is usually, even though they've been slow to adjust a little bit, defensively, they've been pretty tough in the second half of games. It speaks to their depth. And also, I think 
the Penn State defense starts to play, they, they kind of know what's coming, and it gets real hard for – I think red zone defense has been one of the strengths, and I think it's going to need to be again against Maryland. You're right. Jackson's a guy that can – you know, maybe not be a, a, a big running threat, but he's got – he can move in the pocket and extend plays, and they have some speed that can really cause problems for a secondary that's given up some big plays. Last question for you. Do you have a problem with Friday night football? Friday I really, night college football, Friday night Penn State game. I'm not. A, I'm not a football purist, so I would say uh, I, I understand high school football is, is is big in this state and in a lot of states uh, on Friday. But I, I understand why some programs and one, why some why some conferences want to have some games on Friday night. I don't have a problem from it, and it sets me up on Saturday afternoon and Sunday mm-hmm. afternoon. Great for, for selfish reasons. The answer is absolutely not. All right, sounds good. Well, that will wrap up the Penn State Blitz video. The Penn State Blitz podcast rolls on next wherever you find your favorite audio.